if you read the Bible with the Holy Spirit showing you. going to start right away. Father, we thank you for your mighty presence. We thank you for moving amongst us today, Lord, and for filling us with that fresh oil this morning, the Holy Spirit. Your holy presence, Lord, is with us. We thank you, Lord, because without you, Lord, we might as well just be blowing air in the wind, Father. So we thank you today that you're filling us and that your presence is here amongst us, Lord, binding our hearts together. Thank you, Father. Move amongst us, Lord. And I cover us all in the blood this morning. We're covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. You have your way today, Lord. You have your way in our lives. Praise you, Jesus. I just want to encourage y'all to just get involved in the chat today and um, share and just worship with us today. Thank you, Lord. Beautiful Lord, wonderful Savior, I know for sure. All of my days are held in Crafted into your perfect plan You gently call me into your presence Guide me to your Holy Spirit Teach me, dear Lord Goodbye. 
your holy calling set me apart. I know you're drawing me to yourself. Give me your today father we're grateful for all your bounty lord that you pour into us lord for your 
faithfulness, Lord, for your love, for the breath that we even have to breathe, Lord, comes from you. Oh, God, you are such a loving and gracious Father. We love you so much this morning. Anoint your word as it comes forth, Lord. Give us the unction of the Spirit today. Lord God, to say those things that you want us to hear. May they go deep in our spirit, man, Lord God. And may they perform what they're set out to do, Lord. Your plans, your purpose, your word being worked out in our lives, Father, today. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, honey. No, thank you, honey. For playing. And thank you, Lord. The guitar with me. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Beautiful morning this morning. Well, the snow finally stopped here. <laughs> yes, we had snow for two days straight. Now our lamps are completely covered. Oops. 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 There's an earthquake. There's an earthquake. And it's my husband. <laughs> this is not the Lord from the second coming, so. So all you see is the little tops of the lamps on both sides of our driveway. Oh, and the lamps are six feet tall. Yeah. Praise God. Oh. Wonderful Savior. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So here we are, part four of all the parables that are unique or common to the Gospel of Luke, if you've been following along with us. Um, and today, we're going to be looking into the story of Praise the God. vine dresser and the barren fig tree. Get my gum. <laughs> And so, once my lovely wife has finished chewing her gum, we're going to read the passage. Amen. Hold on. In the meantime, while she's blowing, go. while she's blowing bubbles, <laughs> you can go to your Bible. Hey, a little joy, it. right? Luke a little 13, humor. 6, 9. And he told this parable: a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it, and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now, I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. <laughs> but it, if not, you can cut it down. Hmm. Another story of an unfruitful what were you doing? fig tree. I was playing out. I was playing the part of the unfaithful fig. Okay. Actually, no, the vine dresser. Another story of an unfruitful fig tree. Poor old fig tree. You know what? You know I don't know about Poor you, but it also tree. seems as if the Lord had it in for fig trees. <laughs> did he fall Go out? figure did he <laughs> that's good huh did he fall out of one when he was a child do you suppose was he scratched maybe, by his maybe. branches whenever he went looking for fruit were the fig trees in and around nazareth such a pitiful species example of the species that they were chronically fruitless and barren season after season but not only did he cast the fig tree in an unflattering light in this parable, Jesus. but Jesus actually cursed one of the poor things mm. on his way to the temple during the last week of his life. Poor thing. Right, Ari? In the morning, as he was returning to the city, he became hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but only leaves. And he said to it, may no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. I'm being facetious, of course. Fig trees figure prominently in the ministry of our Lord because they were conspicuous by their sheer numbers. There were just many of them around. There was all sorts of them. You couldn't swing a dead 
Don't say it. Donkey. 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 Without hitting a fig tree. Um, they are found everywhere, both in the in their wild and cultivated forms. Cultivated forms, they were found in vineyards and in gardens and palaces and stuff. Um, and you could find them all the way, all through Judea and Galilee, right from the Egyptian border to the northern border of Syria. Um, they were everywhere. So that made them a convenient fodder for whenever Jesus wanted to use them metaphorically or allegorically in his teaching, as he does in this particular parable. The metaphor of an unfruitful tree is, was also used, and we hear the echo of this in this particular parable by John the Baptist when he confronted the Pharisees and the Sadducees uh, who had come to question him at the Jordan. Mm. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourself, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear fruit, good fruit, is cut down and thrown into the fire. Amen. Hmm. In our story, the axe is being laid to the root of this barren fig tree by its owner who despaired of receiving any kind of a crop from the tree. It takes, so I'm told, three years for a mature fig tree to produce its first crop of fruit. And it does, and if it does not by that time, and you'll notice in this parable, it's, it's Jesus mm -hmm. says it is fig tree after three years. The, the owner right. says, for three years, I've been coming to see if there's been fruit on this thing. Um, and if it hasn't produced fruit by the time it reaches three, it's not likely to produce any kind of fruit. Uh, mm. And perhaps... Sorry, I, I just keep getting this image of someone trying to lift up a dead donkey and swing it. <laughs> Sorry. It's pretty hard to lift up a dead donkey, I would think. She didn't want me to say what I usually said, so I had to... Think quick, so yeah. Don't. Anyways, carry on. Um, perhaps what we're glimpsing here, and perhaps mm -hmm. what the Lord is showing here, is a discussion between two members of the Trinity: the Father as the owner of the fig tree, and the mm -hmm. vine dresser, which we might see as the Son. Uh, we have seen previously that the fig tree is mm -hmm. symbolic of the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. Mm. I read the rest, so. Oh, I'll read the rest. Yeah, sure. It says one to seven. Okay. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedges and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed or briar and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. Okay. Remember this, we'll be coming back to this, this song of the vineyard. We'll be coming mm -hmm. back to this in, in later parables because it is important. But this song of the vineyard, mm -hmm. particularly where it says in verse 7, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. Right. I always keep that in mind whenever we're talking about a vineyard in these parables. In this song of the vineyard, the Lord God has pronounced judgment 
on his vineyard because mm. it produced nothing but wild grapes. Again, back to this theme of producing good fruit and bad fruit. Therefore, the Lord will remove his hedge, break down the wall that protected the vineyard. Mm. Similarly, the owner will cut down the fig tree because it did not produce what it was expected to produce. But unlike the vineyard portrayed here in Isaiah, uh, where there was no one to intercede for the unproductive vineyard, the son now steps forward in the guise of the vine dresser, mm -hmm. pleads for mercy from the father. Give me a little more time, father, and I will work to try and get the tree to produce. Mm -hmm. And if I can't in time, in the time that you give me, then you can go ahead and cut it down. I believe I received that from the spirit of God himself. And the reason I say that is because it, it's a perfect picture of why the Lord, why we would think the Lord tarries. Mm. God, the Father has given the Son a specific amount of time that we don't know, and Jesus didn't even he, know. Yeah. Acts 1 says that these the times and the seasons are in the hands of the Father and Him alone. Right. But in this, he's giving, he's giving the Lord a specific amount of time to dig around the fig tree. Mm -hmm. to water it, to manure it, so that it would produce fruit. But at a point, at a time, that time will come up. That, that time will right. be over. So we know that the Lord's primary purpose for coming to earth was kind of a final attempt by the Father to reconcile himself to his, father, to his people Israel. Mm. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that religion, or region... <laughs> That religion. What, what religion would that be? <laughs> From that, that region. Although that region is probably now Muslim. Came, came out and was crying. Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That, that is a verse wow. that, that we as Gentile mm. Christians sometimes have a problem with. We, we don't mm. like to hear that. You know, we think that Jesus came for us, and he did. He did come for us, but his primary. This verse is there in the Bible. This yeah. was, and, and yeah. Jesus Makes said sense. it in Luke when he came. Remember the, the verses of the time of his visitation. He came, and he presented himself as the Messiah to the Jewish people first in, in mm. Jerusalem. But he wept because they didn't receive him. As John said, his, and he came to his own and they received him not. And, he, and Jesus then said, because, because of your unbelief, because you didn't receive who you were looking for when he was standing right before you, this, this city will be destroyed. Time is visitation. And I will take the gospel. He didn't say it there, but later on, Paul mm. brought this out in his letters. And I will take the gospel to the Gentiles. To those who will receive it, and of course, there are many verses in the Old Testament that that back that up, that, that assert that that God says, "I yes. will be found by a people who were not looking for me. I will be God to people who were not. I was not their God," and that is for us. That is that's for us. But in this case, Jesus is making it plain his mission was at first and foremost to the house of Israel, and that's what this parable is hinting at. Right, and suggesting his own people do not receive him, thus making it possible for the promise of salvation to go out to all the world, so that whoever might believe would be saved in this time that the Lord Jesus has been given to plant around us, to dig around us, to, to put yeah. for the fertilizer of the word upon us that we might produce fruit. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that the vine dresser failed and the fig tree was cut down because it still did not produce any fruit regardless of his efforts? Hmm. Or metaphorically, did the church come to replace Israel as the original tree? The answer is no. The fig tree may have been seen to be cut down in the events of 70 AD in the fall and destruction of Jerusalem, but a stump 
from the original trunk mm -hmm. must have remained. Otherwise, right. Romans 11 would not have been possible. And the church as we know it could not possibly exist. But if some of the branches were broken off and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember it is not you who support the root, but the root who, that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. A very, very important verse. Very sobering especially verse. for our ministry. Yes. We are the branches and he is the vine. But remember, some branches have been broken off so that we could be grafted onto that vine. But those branches will Amen. be replaced. And we are not... As, as the church, as mm. the followers of Jesus Christ, we are not to become proud. Mm. And that's why this whole replacement theology is wicked and evil and so, is and so very wrong. Wicked. It's so unbiblical. That it's is not what the Lord taught. That's not what Paul taught. That's not what God wants. That's you. If you think that, then there's no point for the book of Revelation. There's no point for mm -hmm. any of the end time things that we like to study. For God did not spare the natural branches. Israel were the natural branches. Remember, I came for the for the uh, the, the people of Israel. Right. That's what Jesus said. I came for them. We we know that He's come for us, but that was only afterwards. This had to happen first. That's why Palm Sunday is so important. Right. And Jules talked about this earlier on when she was talking about Palm Sunday. She was absolutely right on. We 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 tend to ignore Palm Sunday when we. At Easter, when we mm. come to the, the mm -hmm. events of the Passion, but Palm Sunday is really important. The it reason is. that we are here, we are as Gentile believers, the reason the Gentile church is here is because of Palm Sunday. Not because of the crucifixion. The crucifixion was for everyone. But because the church is now carrying the message of salvation to the world, it's because of Palm Sunday. Because they did not mm -hmm. recognize the time of their visitation. I can't overemphasize that. So we must also consider this parable in a larger context in that it should be considered as a warning of the need of repentance for all human beings. The parable, in fact, is an answer to the nature of sin and death as demonstrated by a pair of events that occurred at, at, during the, at the Lord's time, during the, during the Lord's days. He would ask these questions. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them. Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Jesus, I think, was attempting to correct an erroneous assumption from his audience. Hmm. A, a, an assumption that they were, they were holding, suggesting that death was always a result of sin. Ultimately, it is. We all die because of the sin of Adam right. in this life. Sin leads to death. But not all death is due because of sin. Uh, the point, according to the Lord, was not whether those who died were sinners deserving of death, because in the end, we all deserve that fate. Mm -hmm. Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You're all familiar with that last verse. We're all familiar with that. Mm -hmm. We're all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all recognize that. We all and out of that knowledge, out of out of that perception, our our need of repentance comes and our need to approach the Savior and say, I need you. Mm -hmm. I can't do this my own. You need to save my soul. Praise God. 
But these sober events acted on their minds as funerals do in our day, to focus their thoughts upon the inevitableness of physical <laughs> death. And it's when we are in that place that the Lord can remind us that what is really important, that we repent of our sins so that we may gain eternal life through Christ. Yes. For without Christ, we are like the barren fig tree, producing no fruit, mm -hmm. taking and never giving back in return, while all the time facing the prospect of being cut down by the axe or the judgment of God against the sin that has already laid at the foot of our roots. Right. Strong imagery here. Right. But Jesus, the vine dresser, comes along, intercedes with the Father, and promises to bring life-giving water to our roots and nutrients to the soil of our lives. So to produce a spirit of repentance that will lead to the blossoming of good fruit, befitting true repentance. And it is the fruit that will show whether we are in Christ or we are not. And whether we shall receive eternal life or whether we shall be cut down and thrown into the fire. And finally, Jesus was inferring that his hearers were asking the wrong oh, question. They should not have asked why these people died. But more importantly, why in God's mercy did he allow them to live? For the same reason, the vine dresser asked for one last chance to make the barren fig tree fruitful, because as long as it remained rooted, it had a chance to bring forth expectant fruit. Mm -hmm. So too, as long as you are living, you have the opportunity to accept the way of salvation and bear the Lord's fruit. Wonderful parable, this. And one that we need to all heed. And I, I am confident that most most of the branches that all of the branches that are listening to us you you all know this you have repented before the lord you have received the gift of salvation you have received his love and his grace Amen. into your lives you are not barren fig trees the axe is not laid at the root of your tree Amen. you are producing fruit for the master you are pr pr Amen. producing fruit befitting your repentance Mm. And that's something that the Lord celebrates over us. Amen. Because and the pruning process is a lot different than taking the ox to the root. <laughs> <laughs> the pruning process, you're right, honey, and it takes longer and it takes more work. Mm -hmm. It's easy to cut down a tree. And it is painful. <laughs> yeah, it's easy to cut but, down a tree. Because yeah. it's over and done, but your life's over. But to actually mm -hmm. have Jesus come into your life and snip dig, off those suckers dig, in your life snip off that yeah or fertilizer those on you and that try to get you to produce fruit what a promise that's mm -hmm. a great promise if we let the vine dresser to our roots we allow him to minister to our roots to minister to ourselves we yeah. will produce fruit befitting mm -hmm. repentance and we will be able to hear that wonderful wonderful voice in our ears when we kneel before him and he says well done my good, good and faithful, faithful servant, servant. Into, into your rest so today we or the next parable we're going to deal with is the parable of the unfinished tower and the imprudent king whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple for which of you desiring to build a tower <laughs> does not first sit down and count the cost whether he has enough to complete it otherwise when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish all who see it begin to mock him saying <laughs> this man began to build and was not able to finish or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Did you want me to share my story? Yes, that's right. You have a story. Before I start, Anne has a story that illustrates it, it, this very yeah. and thing. And it's, it's almost like the Lord did it on purpose. He did it on Saturday. This the, yesterday. Saturday. Okay. Well, yesterday. 
and and it gave a, this is a perfect illustration okay so normally I check when I'm baking a cake I get all my supplies ready and okay I have this I have this but yesterday we we're kind of in a hurry we we're going to my mom's for supper and I, I thought okay great I'm gonna bake a cake and just bring it over so and we only had like three hours or something two hours so I, I put the sugar in the mixer and I went to the fridge and I said oh great we only have one egg I need two so I thought great okay I'll improvise I'll use a spoonful of mayonnaise so, and, and that does work by the way and I put it in got the mixer going mixed it all up together and then it called for butter so I didn't I had some butter but I didn't really have enough so I thought okay great I'll mix it um, with some a little bit of lard to make the difference up some Crisco lard and that was fine and then it it was asking for cocoa and I, I'm sure I had I just bought some cocoa so I went to the cupboard no cocoa and that's like three ingredients right there and and she'd already started baking yes and I already started mixing it all together it was all mixed so I thought okay well I'll just grind up some chocolate chips so I ground put them in the coffee grinder ground them up put it in put my baking soda in my flour you know my milk poured it in the pans in my pan and then poured it in these other little pans that I had put it in the oven and I'm I'm doing my dishes and waiting all of a sudden I smell the smell I'm like we all smell the smell <laughs> something was burning I opened the oven and the cake was like bubbling over and frothing over and going on the racks and burning on the bottom of the the oven and Richie comes down and he goes wow it smells like did you bake me apple turnovers turnovers it smells like turnovers yeah so i said uh no but you now you have an object lesson if you're doing doing that parable about the counting the cost <laughs> and he says it just so happens i'm doing that one you know on thursday so here's a new but, parable we jules had one earlier the parable of the um, the cow the sweet potato and the and uh the pregnant cow and now Anne has the parable of the unfinished cake it's still sitting on my counter and count the cost before you turn the oven on make sure you have the ingredients i don't know why it didn't turn out but it i'm not sure i even have to teach on this now because you all get this now yep. get this. so anyway this story appears because a section where jesus is being followed by a very large crowd the majority of whom are following him in hopes of receiving something miraculous from him whether it was healing or feeding or personal provision, etc., We have to remember that. Mm. Most of the people that came to see Jesus when he was preaching weren't really there to hear what he had to say. They wanted what he had to yeah, give them. Yeah, what he wanted to give. Jesus probably disappointed sure. many of them by taking the opportunity to give them a lecture on the true cost of following him. Mm. The kingdom of God is not to be made up of people seeking bread and circuses. In fact, this was a common theme throughout the Lord's earthly ministry, having to constantly try and get people's minds off worldly mm. things and concentrate on those important things from heaven, whether it be an eminent personage like Nicodemus or the nameless faces in the crowds that were fall that followed after him for three years. Mm. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound. But you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness of what we have seen. But you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? It says it right there. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things. And your heavenly Father knows what you need, 
that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Again, there's Matthew 6, 31, 33 again. Seek ye first. And as I told you, that's yep. one of those verses that's going to keep over and over again, because Jesus is harping on this. It's all about the cost of discipleship. Right. The cost of following the Lord Jesus Christ. And in order for the Lord to change the worldly mindset of his listeners, he had to make them aware of what true value of what it was he was telling them. They must seek by appealing to their own life experiences that told them and tells us, mm -hmm. told them about an unfinished tower or a, a king that was foolish enough to go against someone who was stronger than him without counting how many soldiers he had. And in Anne's case, <clears throat> baking a cake when she didn't have the ingredients, our own personal experience that anything of value always comes with a cost. And as we all know, True. a greater gain is never attained without a greater cost. And more mm. importantly, what Jesus is teaching is that in the eyes of the individual who determined what is valuable to him, you are certainly familiar with the old adage, one man's garbage is another man's treasure. You're apt to pay a great, a much greater price for something you consider valuable. Again, and if you remember about the parables we talked about in Matthew, the, the valuable of finding the treasure in the field, finding the pearl beyond great price. You are gonna, you are gonna pay greater price what you consider valuable, even if others do not. You need only attend only a local auction or watch Antiques Roadshow, which is what I do, to know that's true. And you certainly wouldn't think of bidding for anything in an auction if you knew you didn't have the money to buy it. Conversely, we are to consider the cost of the most important decisions we make in life. At the beginning of certainly the marriage true, ceremony, the, the minister will admonish the bride mm -hmm. and the groom to consider what they are about to do. That marriage is not to be mm -hmm. entered in too lightly or unadvisedly, but thoughtfully and reverentially and with the fear of the Lord. Right, right. And that's exactly the point of this parable. Mm. The Lord is essentially saying to his hearers, you count the cost in everything you do on earth, whether it's building a tower or going to war. So too must you count the cost of following me, the Messiah. But be forewarned. It's not as easy or simple as you imagine. And you may be called on to pay a price you are either not prepared or not able to pay. Because if you do follow Christ without counting the cost, not only the cost to yourself, but what it will ultimately cost to everyone around you, your right. friends and your family, then there will come a time when you will be embarrassed, you'll be shamed, you'll be humiliated, causing you to either backslide, as Jules talked about mm -hmm. Sunday, or completely walk away from the Lord. Simon Peter made his profession of undying faith to Jesus without stop to think Amen. what it yes, might did. ultimately wind up costing him. <clears throat> Peter answered him, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. All of them. You remember that. And, you know, we and, and all of us would do that. I'm sure all of us who professed a natural love for Christ at the table. Yeah, you're, this time I did do it. You're right. I did. I did add something. Here. Um, I'm acknowledging you. But, um, we would, we would have all done the same. Lord, we'll die with you. We'll die with you. We, we, like Peter, we wouldn't have counted the cost. We wouldn't have even thought to think about what that might entail, what, what, might, what might be asked of us. And in Peter's case, he was asked to defend the Lord. He was asked to stand up for him. He was asked, he was asked to confirm what he, his, his vow to the Lord at the table, and he didn't do it. He failed miserably. Mm -hmm. And he knew it because what happened? Matthew, later on in this chapter, verse 75. And Peter remembered in the saying of Jesus, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. He was remorseful, repentant. Because Peter realized mm. at that moment what the cost of discipleship was. Right. Judas, too, realized what the cost of discipleship was, although his reaction was different. Totally. 
ended in death eternal. His, he recognized that he had committed a sin. He recognized that he had, mm -hmm. he had condemned innocent blood. And he thought he could make it right by returning the money rather than returning his soul, returning his heart, returning his mind to he Jesus. He wasn't quite fully committed. And Judas, Judas would have been. Hmm. He would have been reinstated as Peter had if he had shown those fruits of repentance. Right. And if someone like Simon Peter, who was with the Lord day and night for three years, who saw him, touched him, heard him speak, saw the miracles and the crowds, but he still faltered because he did not count the cost of his own commitment to Jesus hmm. Christ, then how much more must we count the cost who have neither seen the Lord nor heard him but we believe in faith. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do you disbelieve? But believe. Oh, do not disbelieve. It doesn't say, do you disbelieve? Do okay. not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Do you realize Jesus, the Lord, the second person of the Trinity, is talking to you? Mm. Blessed are you, for you have not seen and yet you believe. Talking to us. He's talking to us. Right. This is a wonderful confirming verse. Mm. Always hold on to it. It's like one of those one of those life preservers in a stormy sea when we're floundering and about to drown we can we can we can jump on this and we can stay alive we can we can float on the stormy waters knowing blessed are you because you have not seen but you believe but you believe there's great power and comfort in that and finally we need to remember that although to many the cost of discipleship the lord jesus is asking of us all is not to be born alone Remember that this parable was told as an explanation um, of his seemingly harsh declaration that he made about becoming a disciple. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yet, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now, Monica w was asking me about this. Oh, okay. This week. And, and this verse doesn't actually mean you hate your family. You hate your mother. To and follow your Jesus, yes. You don't have to yeah, hate because your blood. Because otherwise, blood Jesus blood. Wouldn't, wouldn't have said, you know, honor your mother and father, right? Um, God but, would not have made that one of the yeah, things. Yeah. And as Paul said, the only commandment is a <laughs> promise. It's it's about your willingness, you know, your, your commitment to him. Well, go on. No, and as I said to you when mm -hmm. we were talking about that, and share that with me, and I said, I think what Jesus means here is he perceives that there are many things in a person's lives. And think about the rich young ruler here. There are many things that come into a person's life that keep them from being a disciple. And one of them is natural affection. One of them is yeah. love for family, yeah. love of money, love of, of the things of this world. And when Jesus perceives in one of his followers or someone who wants to, that this is this has precedence in your life, that mm -hmm. the old man is ruling your life and not the, the spirit man in you, that you desire these things, then he gently takes this away and he reminds you he said you cannot love these things more than you love me if you want to serve me and you want to serve me effectively it doesn't mean that you're going to lose your salvation that's not what he's talking about here because the formula for salvation is very easy i think um you you quoted the other night one of us quoted it the other night that uh, we i think we quoted it um, in our testimony in our testimony yes exactly Believe, right on last yeah. weekend we requested it that Romans. if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. That's a simple formula. That's all you need to do. And later on he says, and if that's all you do, then you'll be saved. You'll smell a bit like smoke because mm -hmm. you'll be saved with just the clothes on your back and you won't have anything to give to the Lord in heaven. Mm -hmm. It might be a bit embarrassing, but you will be saved because you believe. That's all you need to do. But there's more to it than that. He's saying, 
He's not saying if you want to be saved, then you got to hate your brother, your mother, and your father. He's not saying that. He's saying if you want to be my disciple, if you want to follow me, pick up your cross. If you, you must do what I do, and I'm doing what the Father tells me to do, and through me, you will do the same thing. But if these other things come in and crowd these paltry things come in and crowd your spiritual life, all Jesus is saying you need to give these up. You need to hate these things. You know you love them too much. You need to hate them now. You need to love the Lord more. You need to love me more. And that's all he's saying here. Mm. That's that's he's, he's really not saying for us to be a true disciple. We hate to, we have to hate our parents because as Anne said, then that goes against other scripture. That goes against the scripture, the Ten Commandments. Right. We're not to honor our mother and father. Well, that's not right. That's not true. And there's certainly in the Mosaic Law, there was all sorts oh, yes. of commands about Definitely. Ownership about land ownership. If land becomes, you know, how you, it was important that 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 be done legally. But if that becomes your your raison d'être for existence, if if you're only doing that, like the like the rich farmer, filling his barns. The last time we talked, he never even gave a thought to his soul, anything that was spiritual in him. Just want to make bigger barns. So you can't be a disciple that way. Those things come in the way. You can't serve God and men. Mm -hmm. So. He's not asking, again, he's not asking you to not, to, to hate your parents, hate your children, hate your wife, hate in, your, in a literal, in a sense. He's just sense, saying yeah. when those things become sort of more important than they should be in your life, you're out of balance and others. you need, to, you need to hate those. He's just contrasting them. So, mm -hmm. so, to, I mean, to, to compris, <laughs> we must be confident that when we pick up our own cross, when we have counted the cost of every step we have taken to Jerusalem, knowing what awaits us there, Amen. just as the Lord Jesus did, God will send us help in whatever form he chooses Amen. so that we do not bear our cross alone in the service of the Lord. And you may not have thought about it in those terms, but that we have a good example of this, about how we will not bear our crosses alone. Amen. And as they led him away, they seized one, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. Amen. Amen. Because he was so scarred. He was half dead anyway. Half dead, yeah. Hmm. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for these truths that yes. you have shared with us today in your word. We thank you, Father, that we are confident that we are your children, that we are the sheep of your sheepfold, that we know your voice, Lord. I pray that we hear your voice, Lord, during these studies, yes, during our worship, during our time together, when we, we will, take Father, communion together, us, when Jules is teaching, when the branches gather together, Lord, we will hear your voice. We thank yes, you, Lord, for reminding us of the cost that I once heard it said, Father, that the easiest thing in the world to be is a Christian, and the hardest thing in this world is to be a Christian. And it's, I know the truth of that, Lord God. It's, we can profess that we believe, but we need to walk in that belief. We need to walk in the light as you are in the light. We need to bear fruit as befitting repentance, Lord God. We thank you, Father, for these parables that remind us, Father, of these eternal truths. We thank you, Father, that we are bound together in the spirit of unity. And that you remind us every time we get together that we are yours, Lord. Because the Holy Spirit brings conviction, brings healing, brings understanding, brings illumination that allows us, Father, to do the good works that you have fashioned us for, and that you call us to do as witnesses to you in this world. Father, we thank you for each one who has joined us today, Lord. and pray, Father, your mighty blessing upon each and every person, Father God. I pray that this word will go down deep into their hearts, Lord, that they will meditate upon a deeper truth, Lord. And you will show them, Father, the greater depths, the greater intimacy, the greater joy that we can have, Lord, by walking with you, walking closely with you. And when we count the cost, and when we see what we shall gain by what it is that we are giving up, we shall know, Lord, that it was all worth it. For you will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Come into your master's rest. 
We thank you, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Draw me close to you Never let me go
Lord God, we draw near to you. You said in your word, if we draw near, you will draw near to us. Yes, Lord. We thank you, Lord. That you're ever so close to us, Lord. Praise God. So, shine, Jesus, shine in your life. Hallelujah. Be blessed. We're praying for you. That's right. Be blessed, branches. Pray for each other. Pray for us. And stay blessed. And stay blessed. <laughs> Hallelujah. Stay blessed. Big hugs. Everyone group hug. <laughs> and, God bless. And count the cost. Amen. Bye. Bible with the Holy Spirit showing you.